We're not crazy, the system is. Tune in to Madness Radio, Voices and Visions from Outside Mental Health, Wednesdays 6 to 7 p.m. Eastern Time on Pacifica Affiliate WXOJLPFM 103.3 Valley Free Radio. Produced by Freedom Center and the Icarus Project. Streaming live, podcasting, and archived at madnessradio.net. Welcome to Madness Radio. I'm your host, Will Hall. Today we are talking with Haya Grossberg, who is a longtime organizer with the Freedom Center. But first, um, a little bit about Madness Radio. We are co-produced by Freedom Center and the Icarus Project. Freedom Center is a local Northampton, Massachusetts activism support and advocacy group run by and for people who have different um, psychiatric labels like schizophrenia, bipolar, um, OCD, um, borderline, people who are looking for alternatives to the mainstream system and who are working to challenge human rights abuses in uh, psychiatry and mainstream mental health. We have a lot of different kinds of services and groups going on. You can check out our website, which is freedom-center.org. Madness Radio is also co-sponsored by the Icarus Project, which is an international network, mostly an an online network, but there are also local groups around the country of people who don't identify with the medical definition of mental illness and who are looking to other avenues like creativity, spirituality, art, music, poetry. Um, There's an online um, community with a lot of different forums, different people having all kinds of different discussions. And uh, you can check that out at theicarusproject.net. So my guest today is Haya Grossberg. Haya has been involved with the Freedom Center for, I guess, about four years now and is one of the leading organizers. Haya is one of the yoga teachers for the Freedom Center's free uh, yoga class and also does a writing group that she's been doing for several years. Uh, Haya is a poet and writer and activist in the mental health system, and it's really great to have you on the show. Welcome to Madness Radio, Haya. Thank you. So we just wanted to talk a bit about your experiences um, in the mental health system, your experiences with madness, and then the different ways that you um, are able to take care of yourself. How did you, when did you first sort of get involved with the system or first start struggling with um, extreme states of consciousness or really difficult emotions or? Um, When I was in high school, I was, I had a therapist. Um, In my family, my mom was a therapist and she sort of idealized therapy and that was her, her preferred way of dealing with most things, which actually was helpful to me when I was younger. Um. How old were you when you were having therapy as a as a kid? I probably went to a therapist for the first time when I was between eight and ten, uh, when my parents got divorced. Wow, that's pretty that's pretty young for an eight year old kid going to a therapist. Yeah, I mean it was like play therapy sort of thing, um, mm-hmm. <laughs> and actually that was the same therapist that I saw throughout high school. So I had known her for a long time, and I actually liked her and. For me, actually, that was one of the best, one of my best experiences with the mental health system was the beginning, um, because I actually liked my therapist and found that it was helpful for me when I was a child because I didn't have anyone else I could talk to. Um, So your parents are going through this divorce and the therapist was a helpful person to uh, connect with around that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I was from Brooklyn, so my communal life, like I didn't really have connections with a lot of other adults or with a lot of support in my life. I mean, I was, I had a very stressful childhood. I went to large schools, large, very competitive schools and just didn't have a lot of support. So for me, therapy at that time was actually a respite. Um, but I was, it was like, I didn't know anything. I didn't know anything about the system or where it could lead. I was just like a child to therapy. It was like, wow, there's this great person who can listen to me (laughs) and she's nice. And she tells me that there's nothing wrong with me because I have feelings. (laughs) That sounds pretty good. (laughs) Yeah, it was. Um, (laughs) So, but once I was in high school and started to get depressed, for the first time, I actually started to see that there was another side to the mental health system. Um, When my therapist sort of pressured me to take antidepressants. Um, How old were you when that happened? About 15. Were you having really um, bad depression or, or anxiety or what was going on? Yeah, I was I was very anxious and low, um, you know, because of the me- the reasons I mentioned before about my family and my stressful school life and just 
not having really any support in my life. Um, and also just all the basic reasons why anybody would get depressed were happening to me, like bad nutrition, bad, you know, like stressful lifestyle. Being 15 years old. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, even just living in New York, it was just like a stressful life, I feel. Um, so you went on Prozac and how did that work for you? Um, well, I had a lot of resistance to going on it. And even right from the beginning, just the pills themselves felt to me kind of like this death, like this horrible thing. Like I felt like I was turning into plastic, like I would cry and my tears, like I felt like my tears were like, like paint or like something non-real, like I wasn't a person anymore or something. Um, after a while, I started to get kind of like manic happy, like I would, I just felt less like in my mind, less like less concerned with anything, but just kind of like able to socialize more um, freely. And so it had some effects that seemed positive at first. Uh, but I, but I ended up going off of it after a few months because I just didn't really want it. Um, and you know, it was in the eighties. It was a little bit, the mental health system to me seemed quite different than it is now in that it wasn't as accepted. It wasn't as mainstream for people to take antidepressants. So I didn't even tell my father at the beginning. Yeah. That was right at the beginning of when Prozac first came out, right? I'm not sure. Do you know which year it came out? I think it was in the late eighties. So. Right. So yeah, it was, yeah. So this was more in the mid nineties, I guess, actually, even though I said the eighties, it was actually the mid nineties that I was on it. But yeah, it was, it was pretty early still in the, in the notion that, that people should take drugs for their states of mind. It wasn't, it wasn't the mainstream notion yet. <laughs> so, um, you know, I didn't really like, I guess, you know, I had some other friends who'd been put on drugs, but it wasn't talked about as widely as it is now. It was, I felt like it was more of something that needed to be very much a secret. Um, so then what, um, what happened? You, you went off the Prozac and then how did things go for you after that? Um, well, things when I went off of it were fine. I think that it did have some negative effects on my immune system, but it was easy to go off of it and I didn't even really think about it, you know. And then the next year I went to college. So this was like my senior year of high school that I went off of it, you know, had a good summer, went to college. And then when I was at college, um, I went to a counselor there, but I, I didn't ever, at first, in my first year of college, I never um, went back on antidepressants, even though you know, I, I wasn't very happy. Um, in the beginning of college, I definitely had a lot of anxiety. But to me, a lot of these things are really like normal experiences, not really having to do with anything that would actually, you know, that would require medical intervention. So then in my but then in my second year of college, I started to have some more some very different types of intense experiences. Uh, in the summer before my second year of college, I went to a meditation center, a Buddhist center. Well, in the beginning, it was like great. I felt so, you know, I had started becoming interested in yoga and meditation, even in high school, even, you know, in the early years when I was being put on Prozac. Um, I was, I felt really helped by yoga and meditation, like right from the beginning when I tried it. And I started to want to do it more. And at the center that I went to in Vermont, um, it was kind of like the thing to meditate as much as you could. So people would meditate for five hours a day if they could. And that was like considered to be this amazing thing. And it was really amazing at first. Like I felt like I was really high all the time um, when I meditated that much, especially with other people, because I it was like a, a communal thing. Um, so then when I got back to college, I wanted to continue that lifestyle, even though I didn't have that community around me. I, I wanted to continue to meditate a lot because it made me so happy. Um, and in part, it was kind of like a liberation from the confines of my family and my childhood. It felt like I could, I could be, I could escape from that that stressful reality into a more peaceful state of mind. When you look back on those, that state of being high and being happy, do you think that was a healthy kind of high, or was there something that wasn't quite balanced about it, or something? It's hard to say. I mean, sometimes even when I hear the word healthy, it doesn't really mean anything to me anymore because it's so subjective. But um, in some ways, I feel it was healthy, but it did go, it did get to the point where it wasn't healthy. And also, I guess my desire to move on from the stresses of my family and to escape the difficulties of my childhood ended up turning into a sort of desire to just like 
like a naive desire to just escape the whole thing, just to say, okay, I'm going to do something totally different. I'm going to be a Buddhist. I'm going to be a peaceful person and leave that whole reality behind me, which that wasn't really the answer for me in the long term. So there's a way in which the meditation is kind of like part of a denial process, maybe? Yeah, as well, like the meditation along with this sort of plunge into Buddhist thought, you know, because I was brought up Jewish and I, I wasn't very religious growing up. I mean, it's there's always, you know, very varying degrees of religion, but my family's very culturally religious and I learned Hebrew, I had a bat mitzvah. You know, I didn't really connect with the spirituality of Judaism until much later, but to me, Judaism wasn't even, a, it, it wasn't even a spirituality until until I realized it was, which was like when I was, you know, in my lower 20s, late, like a few years later, after I'd been in college for a few years. So, um, so oh, go ahead. So you went back to college hoping and wanting to continue this kind of experience that you had had at the meditation retreat. Right. So, and I also, not just the experience of meditation, but also I was reading a lot of books about Buddhist thought. And also the books were written by American Buddhists like Pema Chodron. And they were kind of like psychological Buddhism, which, you know, isn't even, in my opinion, necessarily have that much to do with Buddhism. It has something to do with an American desire to do to have a certain state of mind um, that, that has been taken from or that has been turned into Buddhism, <laughs> an idea of Buddhism. But um, anyway, I did that for a while and I really isolated myself a lot when I got back to school. Um, I, st I stayed in contact with a lot of people at Karma Choling, which is the Buddhist center I was at in Vermont. Um, and then I was planning to do a one month retreat in January at, Verm at Karma Choling, uh, a group retreat which I did end up doing. Um, so it was on my January break. And then um, another thing was that I was starting to lose weight when I was in this state of mind because some of the teachings in, in the books that I was reading said stuff about um, sort of relating with your mind even in relation to how much you eat. Like it could be just your mind telling you that you're hungry and to just notice your mind doing that. And I'm really skinny, so I'm like not the sort of person that should do that because like I'm not somebody who ever overeats or has ever had like that sort of so I've always, like I've always had the problem of like I, I have to make sure I eat enough or I'll, if I like don't eat enough I'll lose weight and get sick or something so, so it sounded like a lot of it sort of um helped you um helped your tendency to kind of go up into your head a little too much and lose sort of touch with what some of your basic needs were yeah, I mean, the, the truth <clears throat> The truth is that when I was meditating, I wasn't really in my head. I actually was very present in my senses and in my my body and my spirit. But after a while, you're right, it did start to become like more of a dissociated state where I was kind of like spaced out or not really there, especially when I started to lose weight because for me to lose even five pounds is like kind of dangerous. <laughs> so so then, then once I went to Karma Choling to do the one-month retreat, I started to lose more weight. I got sick and then I had lost, you know, maybe 10 or 15 pounds and was dangerously thin. Um, which I think that was actually a large part of the dissociate, the dissociation that I experienced. But, um, so I did the one month retreat and I came back to college and was really in like a kind of dissociated state. I would lie on the floor of my dorm room, just kind of like feeling like I wasn't in my body. Um, and I just I actually had sort of had trouble eating like I like I just didn't have as much of an appetite anymore and had trouble like eating large amounts at a time. Um, I think in part because I had sort of told myself in my mind that like I should eat less. Um, and it wasn't like some kind of self image thing or anorexia thing. It was like kind of like an aesthetic thing, I guess. Like I felt like I shouldn't eat. So eat, eat. I should eat as little as possible. Uh, and were the teachers at the meditation retreat, were they, um, did they notice what was going on with you or did you receive any kind of guidance about maybe some of the dangers that you were in at this point? Yeah, I did. They, they were concerned about me. Um, and they were concerned that I was like, they were concerned that I shouldn't do the retreat and I really wanted to do the retreat. So I just kind of, um, you know, kind of tried to convince them or I did somehow successfully convince them that it was fine for me to do the retreat. So they kind of saw that you were having some problems and really kind of getting unstable or something, just the way you were presenting yourself. Yeah, they could tell that. And they were kind of concerned. They were actually concerned that I was, you know, like kind of losing it. And they somebody told me that um, 
you know, a lot of people my age, when they get into meditation, it can be dangerous because they can sort of get into um, whatever, quote unquote, psychotic states of mind. So, but they did let you go back to the retreat. So you went again and then what happened? Um, Yeah, I did the whole retreat. And then when I got back to college, um, when I was in this state, you know, I I still had a lot of community at Hampshire and a lot of people who knew me and cared about me enough to tell me that I should go to, well, one of my friends told me that I should go to health services and see a therapist. Uh, So I did that and I saw a therapist there. But right away, right when I got there, they immediately wanted to give me medicine. Like they, they drove me over to UMass. That like, it was like, I got there they drove me over to UMass. I saw a psychiatrist. It was like this whole really fast thing. And they gave me an antidepressant and I didn't want to take it. But then I guess like I'd been in this sort of out of the world state of mind for so long that there was this part of me that was like, maybe if I take this medicine, it'll just make me normal again. And I can just be like everyone else and have a normal life and just move on from all this weirdness. So when you say um, make you normal again, was this, was this kind of like the spaced out sort of state that you were in? Were you also having depression or anxiety or what was sort of your state of consciousness that they would look at you and say, oh, we want to put you on a, an antidepressant? Was it the not eating or what, what was going on? It was really a combination of the not eating enough and being like too thin, um, being dissociated a lot of the time, feeling like I wasn't in my body or I didn't, I couldn't like connect, I couldn't feel grounded. And then I was also very anxious, which I think is also just part of that I wasn't eating enough and that I had lost a lot of weight and just the state of my body mind was that I was anxious. Um, And another thing I just wanted to mention was that I didn't trust anyone at this time, which I think was another thing with like when the... Uh, meditation teachers at my at the center were you know trying to convince me not to do the treat retreat it was like I just didn't trust them I trusted only the thoughts in my mind that were telling me like of how I should should act or what I should do um so so of course I didn't trust the uh psychiatrist either but um you know and I remember I was sitting in his office and I said like that I just I was like I just don't feel connected to my body or myself and he was like that's okay just just look at me just just be connected to me in this moment you know and it was kind of like he felt like as long as I could just see him then everything was fine (laughs) it didn't matter if I could connect to myself (laughs) so um then what next well I only took that antidepressant for like a few days like if it was that feeling of oh I can be normal again and I was excited and like right when I got on the drug like I immediately felt this is wrong this is like this intense chemical because of course like I was probably weighing like 95 pounds at five foot eight you know at that time and like taking a drug was just so intense for my system because especially with like not eating enough um so yeah like I felt totally doped up but I also felt this sense of like spontaneity and excitement and like like this whole like this idea which is like a totally ungrounded state as well (laughs) um but then I stopped taking the drug after a few days and um you know, I knew that I didn't want it, but, uh, I, so then I sort of sought a lot of different alternative healing treatments at that time. Cause I was really, really determined to heal what, or to regain my health without <clears throat> resorting to that. Like I, I really felt that I had a very strong inner conviction that there was a way for me to regain my health naturally and with ways that felt right and good to me. So I started doing all these different things like Rolfing and, you know, I started, I started eating a lot more and, you know, I just, I just sort of step by step regain my connection with like basic grounding things. Like I started running, you know, I did yoga. I didn't meditate for a few months after that. Cause I just felt a little too scared to, and I just knew that, that I needed to do like very basic things like writing again. I started writing again, which I hadn't been for a while. So all of these like basic, just very, very simple, basic things were really what helped me to regain my health over the next uh, season, which, you know, it, it worked and it happened. So. so you got back interested in Judaism and it was hard to connect with other people around it, but it felt really meaningful to you. And then this is your third year of school. And then something started to happen that you ended up, you started down a path of crisis and ended up in the system again. Yeah. Um, well, I started fasting again. <laughs> I started getting into, um, it was, it was totally different than the first time, but I did start to do some fasts and to lose some weight. Um, and sort of this connection with Judaism ended up making me sort of not go to some of my classes towards the end of the year. So I didn't finish all my classes. And then over the summer, I didn't want to go back home to my family. Um, 
because I felt it would be too stressful. So I ended up, but like circumstances just led me to be back with my family because I had gotten this apartment, blah, blah, blah. Like it, like an apart, all these apartments fell through. And even though I had some money saved up, I think that I somehow didn't have a place to stay. So I ended up back in Brooklyn with my family. Um, and I was pretty ungrounded and ended up, um, having a sort of crisis in the New York City subway station that where I saw an old friend of mine and she could tell that I was very ungrounded again. Um, and she like basically called my parents and told them how I was acting. Um, and they were worried about me. So, so I got home that night and, um, my dad had come and, and at first my mom's house was empty and I just, stay there for a while but then my dad came over and then my mom got home and they were both really worried about me so it was kind of like this awkward thing where I was on a couch and I was also feeling like I couldn't really speak like I didn't trust my parents I felt I was in this really intense state where I just it was kind of like I, I just wanted everything to be between me and God because I didn't trust anyone I really didn't trust my parents um so somehow I appeased them like my mom was kind of like she looks very peaceful which I actually did I felt very peaceful and kind of full of faith despite what was going on um, and I just I wouldn't talk I was like writing something down like my dad asked me a question and I wrote down an answer and it was all part of it was like all about just that I was in love with this person who was sort of ignoring me to some extent so you know like I just wrote on this piece of paper I love so and so or whatever um, so then um, I somehow kind of appeased that situation. And, oh, I guess my mom had asked me if I wanted to go to the hospital. And I said, um, tomorrow. Like, I was just really tired. I just wanted to sleep. And I was like, tomorrow, you know. So, so I went to sleep that night. But then in the morning, I didn't actually want to go to the hospital. And my mom wanted me to. So she called the police. They came up into my bedroom. And I was, you know, I was acting pretty, you know, in ways that they could ident- that they could call kind of crazy. Like I was you know, wanting, just kind of obsessing about little things that, that I was focusing on, um, that they would probably think were crazy or whatever. So they like handcuffed me and brought me in an ambulance to the hospital. And I was like calling this guy who I was in love with on my, on my mom's cell phone. And he was leaving me messages and it was like this weird thing. Um, but like from the ambulance, you know, um, and then I got to the hospital in Brooklyn, which was actually like two blocks away from my house, but they had to bring me there in an ambulance with handcuffs. Um, and I really didn't want any medicine. You know, I just, I did not want any anything put in me. I was like very, very, like even more so because I was on this raw foods diet. I was like, I don't want any of that stuff in me. So you say they handcuffed you. Were you resisting them or, or putting up a fight or anything? Yeah, I was. I didn't want to go. I didn't want to go with them. You know, I really didn't. Um, and my mom, I think, was just really worried about me and had no other clue as to what to do. But I still, you know, she, she to this day doesn't think that she made the right decision in doing that but um because it doesn't sound like you were suicidal or threatening anybody with hurting anybody or anything like that no no um i wasn't not that that would necessarily be a justification for putting you in handcuffs and carting you away to the hospital if you were but it sounds like it was pretty questionable what they did yeah definitely and the other thing is there was a lot of stuff going on in my family that they were all trying to put on to me just me and make me seem like the one who was crazy but really like my family was extremely shut down and had no idea how to communicate you know and if they were able to communicate with me in a more gentle and open way you know I would have talked to them about what was going on at least a little bit but they were like extremely closed and just had no no ability to like hear anything about what was going on with me you know, they just wanted like an answer, like, what is this? But like, they had no whatever. So um, at the hospital, they ended up shooting me um, with uh, some kind of tranquilizer, which like, made me sleep. And then, you know, they just gave me a whole bunch of medicine that made me basically sleep all day and all night and (laughs) eat sleep. Basically, that's it. Um, (laughs) but then I got transferred to this other hospital, um, in upstate New York called Four Winds, which was a little different. There were a lot more people my age there. It was like a place where they actually had a place where you could go outside and walk around in a very small yard. Um, and at this hospital, you were actually sort of allowed to refuse your medication where like at the one in Brooklyn, that was like 
totally like it would have been totally out of the question like in the one in Brooklyn it, I felt like I was treated like a prisoner or somebody who had done something very seriously wrong and better get online to take the, these <laughs> drugs to as a punishment but um at the one in upstate New York it was it was looser there were it, it just felt a little bit more like there were more people my age there um so they had changed my dose of Risperdal and they had increased it when I had asked them to decrease it. So, but then there was some kind of glitch in their system where they couldn't change it. It was like they had set the amount of the drug I was supposed to get and they had to give me that amount. So they told me that if I wasn't able to take it, I could refuse for that one dose. But, you know, then the next time they would have they would get it right. So I said, okay, I'll refuse this dose, you know, and then I was, and then I realized I can actually refuse my medication, my medication. They always call it your medication. Like right when you get there, it's suddenly like something that is yours. That's your identity, which I always think is ridiculous. But, um, so (laughs) I started to refuse my medication, (laughs) the medication that had been given to me, um, after a psychiatrist spoke to me for a few minutes. So that was the beginning of a really intense period at the hospital because there were a lot of other people there who I think were on the same wavelength as me. A lot of people my age who'd had spiritual things and we would have groups there and everybody would be like, this isn't a mental health issue. This is a spiritual issue or something like that. And like, it was kind of clear that there were a lot of us that were on the same wavelength. Um, although I was the only one who refused the medication. They decided at some point that in order to keep me in the hospital, they had to, I had to take medication, I think, you know, because of pharmaceutical company money and issues of, of that. So it's actually like, you're not really, it's, it's very hard for, for them to keep people in the hospital who aren't taking medication, I think, because of the pressure from the pharmaceutical industry. So, cause that's where the money is coming from. Um, so they were going to have a court case where I would get I think it's also they their sort of definition is very circular. It's like the people who are ill need medication, and medication is sort of defines what people who have needs are. If, if if you have needs, it must be medication, and medication defines the fact that you're there. So the idea that someone would actually be in the hospital without being on medication kind of throws a whole monkey wrench in their logic, I think. Right, definitely. I also heard somebody say recently that um, a lot of a lot of the issues actually stem from people's families. Like people, like people's families have difficulties. They turn it around on one person in the family, and then actually the people who work in the hospitals imitate that behavior. They imitate that behavior of sort of scapegoating individuals and calling them like mentally ill or crazy or outcasts. So they were so they were going to have this court case to have me locked up, and I was so strong minded. I was like, I will do. I really wanted to make a scene about this because I believed in it so much, and I really did not want to live on that medication. Like it made me so it made me feel really stupid and tired, and so in a way, it felt like this this really huge leap of faith and like spiritual thing where I was like, even if like even if I end up getting locked up in like the worst hospital in the world, I'm going to like make a scene about this so that everyone else will see that it's important to fight for your rights and like whatever. So, um, you know, even when they threatened to have me locked up, I was like, I'm not going to take this medication. So eventually my mom came and picked me up because she really didn't want me to have to get locked up in a state hospital or, you know, have to be in this court case, which I would have to probably lose um, because the judges just always side with that side. Um, with the other side. So I ended up going home for a while and living with my father. Um, and then, you know, things, things in my life were just kind of going slowly. Like I wasn't really doing anything according to the way my parents saw it. Um, you know, I was living a very slow paced life, um, like for a season or so, and they didn't really know what to do with me. They didn't really know, you know, what I was experiencing. And it was like, I couldn't go back to school because my parents, you know, realized that things were going on, but then I was living with my parents. So it was really hard for me living with my parents. Um, I just felt somehow very isolated from the world and just everything I'd gone through, like I just kind of was in my own own world. Like I avoided my parents, like when my father came home, I went out, you know, I would stay home all day while he was at work and just spent, you know, whatever. So, you know, I had a few friends who I talked to on the phone, but primarily I just did my own thing and like isolated myself. When did you start becoming a client at Windhorse in Northampton? 
um, the following January, right after this. So my parents found out about Wind Horse. I actually told my mom about Wind Horse because I had heard of it from being at Hampshire College in this area. And what is Wind Horse? Just for people who don't know necessarily. Yeah, Wind Horse is a, a therapeutic community um, that sets people up, individuals up with a, uh, an apartment, a housemate, and a team of um, therapists and other mental health workers. Or, you know, some of them aren't necessarily therapists, but... Uh, it's in Northampton and I, my parents found out about it. It's extremely expensive. Um, and I guess at that time, me and my parents somehow came to the agreement that that would be the best thing for me to do. Um, because I didn't want to live with, I felt in a way my parents, like my idea was that like, I should just get my own apartment, but I didn't have that much money. Um, so somehow it became like, it made more sense somehow to my parents to spend $40,000 a year on wind horse than to like pay for me to have my own apartment. But <laughs> anyway um so you know i guess they wanted they wanted some idea that you know i'd be quote unquote taken care of or have some kind of care so did you like wind horse i mean was it helpful what were some good things and some maybe not so good things about it um well in the beginning it was really somewhat negative uh they uh, well i guess when i got there i was only on a very small amount of medication still um which i immediately like decided to go off of but I had also been on some like Xanax. So I was having some panic attacks from withdrawal from Xanax. And then I got off of this other anti-anxiety <clears throat> called Boost Bar. So I started to have panic attacks from withdrawal from going off of both of those. Um, and Windhorse didn't really know that much about medication and how it affects people. You know, they had a nurse who basically, you know, encouraged me to take medication. Um, <clears throat> and... Uh, so there were a lot of, a lot of issues with, at Windhorse I felt around, um, also the fact that my parents were spending the money for me to be there. So th the therapists were all talking to my parents all the time. And I just had this sense at the beginning of like a very intense pressure. Like if I don't, you know, if things don't happen quickly, my parents are going to take away the, the funding for Windhorse. I'm going to end up back with them. And this whole thing is just going to be like one big, horrible downward spiral. <laughs> so. Um, so I guess, you know, it was a lot for me in the beginning of more manipulation, kind of manipulation, trying to like do things so that people would think I was getting better or, go or cooperating or something, more, more like cooperating. So, um, so I ended up actually getting on several more drugs while I was at Windhorse, or in the beginning at Windhorse. And I think because the therapists there actually did listen to me, they actually did treat me with some level of respect or apparent respect, I didn't quite, I didn't feel as obviously as victimized as I did in the hospital because there was a lot of discussion around everything, a lot of time, a lot of patience, quote unquote. But um, I did end up, you know, on several more drugs that made me really sick. So I was like, you know, getting fever, getting flus every like two weeks, you know, I had my immune system was so, so poor at that time. Did they notice that it was the drugs that was causing this? I mean, what were they concerned about that? No, they had no idea. They just thought it was like chronic fatigue or like illness that was caused by depression itself or something like that. Um, and, you know, I didn't like I was on three drug, three uh, mental health drugs and then several other like like it was like one of the drugs made my thyroid off. So my doctor put me on a thyroid medication and I was on like a sleeping pill, you know, so I was on a whole bunch of things and it just made me really like not clear. Like I didn't know what was going on. I didn't even care. You know, like my doctor would say, I'm going to put you on this. And I'd be like, okay, you know, whatever, you know, like it's just another pill to take every day. So, and like, that's like totally the opposite of my nature. I'm not like that, you know, that without drugs, I would never be that way. Yeah. I remember meeting you around that time and you were, your body looked really toxic. I mean, you looked like you were very ill. I mean, it's night and day. Now you seem extremely healthy and, and alive. And back then it seemed like you were really having a lot of physical problems. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you met me after, even after, like I had had a three month fever from being on all those drugs and then I had started to go off of them. And you met me, I guess, you know, seven months after the process that I was in of reducing. So I was only probably on one antidepressant when you met me and maybe one or two other minor, minor, whatever, one or two other, um, like 
like maybe a sleeping pill and some other thyroid thing. But you were still in the process of detoxing from all that in your system, I guess. Oh, absolutely. Especially since I had had a fever for three months. So I hadn't, you know, I had, I couldn't even walk around my block. I was so weak. Um, so just the fact that my body had gotten so unhealthy made it take so long to detox from all of those drugs. And uh, when did things start to change for you at Windhorse? When did you start to get off of the medication, I guess, start to leave there? Well, after the fever, just, I had this fever for three months. I didn't know if it would, I guess that there was part of me that knew at some point it would go away. There, I think all along throughout this, there was part of me internally that knew that I was going to recover from everything and that I would eventually get out of this whole mess. But, um, so the fever just one day after three months miraculously went away. Like all of a sudden I didn't have a fever anymore, which was like, whoa. <laughs> so suddenly, um, so then I had like some dream that indicated to me that I should start to go off of Risperdal, which was one of the drugs I was on. Um, hey, before you get into that, just let me just ask you, so you you have this fever for three months. What are they telling you is the cause of it? I mean, why they're saying it was chronic fatigue syndrome or something or? Yeah, that's basically what we thought. Uh, that's basically, I guess, what the notion was, or it was, quote unquote, an energy crisis <laughs> where I didn't have any energy. Um, yeah, there was no mention of the fact that I was taking like seven pills a day and that that could be causing it. You know, and I think at one point my mom suggested that, um, you know, that maybe some of the drugs, and, you know, a few people along the way suggested, well, maybe some of these drugs are making you tired, but like there was never really very much, you know, it was, I, I, I guess. I don't know. It was never really followed up on. So So then the fever broke and then you started to decide to, you had a dream. What, what, say a little bit about what the dream was about that told you that you should get off of medication or start reducing. Um, I had a dream that just indicated that I should reduce Risperdal. Um, so then I started to go off of it, but it, but initially I had a lot of very intense panic. I'm really curious, what was what was the dream? That's really all I remember about the first dream is that it had to do with telling me to get off of Risperdal. But then I had, but then when I once I started to get off of Risperdal and have trouble getting off of it, I had another dream that like was a, that told me how much of Risperdal I should get off. It was like you should try reducing by point two five or something like that. It had like, and I don't think it was actually exactly accurate. It it didn't end up being right, but it just it just clued me into the fact of like I need to go slower, like I need to reduce by less, or something. So. And at some point in this, you also, um, I think, came by a protest that the Freedom Center yeah. was doing. Tell us about that, because I, I like that part of the story. <laughs> yeah, that was a good story. Um, so, you know, this is much later when I'd already gotten off of Risperdal and, a cup and another drug. Um, I still thought that I needed to be on, you know, at least maybe one antidepressant for the rest of my life. You know, I still just really was in that state of mind of, like, I'm mentally ill, which somehow, from being at Wintour, has gone into my mind. Um but I was uh, walking by and I had already met somebody from the Freedom Center who told me who, no, he hadn't told me about it, but I heard somebody speaking out about how she had been on a whole bunch of medication. Maybe I think she said 12 drugs and she said that she was sleeping all day and um, then she had somehow gotten off of all of them. And now she said she's working at a coffee shop and doing great and she doesn't think that she's any more mentally ill than the average person that works at a coffee shop. And I think this was at a speak out that we did on the at the courthouse steps in downtown Northampton, right? Yeah. Yeah. So when I heard that, it really clicked in my mind and suddenly I realized, wow, maybe I was like, yeah, I don't have to be on these drugs for my life either. I can get off of these. I can get off of all of them and it is possible, you know, so suddenly I definitely had this conviction that it was possible and I knew that I had to do it. And I, I had, so the, uh, fall, that, this was in the fall, but the previous spring I had decided to go back to Hampshire College, which was like this huge leap of faith because I couldn't even really stay awake for more than two or three hours at a time at that time. Um, but I just knew there was just something in me that knew I have to, I have to reapply to Hampshire and go back. So Somehow I went through all the loops, like I had the interviews with people and like applied and wrote the essays and everything. Like, I guess I had nothing else to do besides just focus on that. And like, I just had this really strong feeling that I need to do it. So I guess they picked up on that um, and they reaccepted me um, back. So in the fall, I was going back and I knew that if I was on this medication, I wouldn't be able to be as successful in school. Like, I just knew that my mind wasn't working the way it used to. So, you know, so I... That was also part of my motivation to get off of it completely. But I was still on one drug while I was 
or still on one psychiatric drug while I was back at Hampshire. And it did make me, you know, all the stuff that I'd been through made my mind much less sharp. And I felt very like inferior when I was at school. Like I wasn't thinking at the level of other people and I wasn't writing very well. Um, and, you know, my professors noticed it and it was really frustrating. <laughs> but you were able to go and, and finish your degree at Hampshire, right? Yeah, it was very, it was, it took a lot of frustration, but I did, I did finish it. Um, so, so bring us up to date. So how did you sort of get from there to the place you're at now, which is much, um, happier and healthier and active and doing a lot of things and working and stuff? Um, well, over time, you know, over the next few months, I got off of every single drug that I'd been on. I wasn't on, so after, by the, uh, spring of the following year, I wasn't on any drugs and all I really had to do in terms of Hampshire was finish up this, um, final paper like a long story so I did that um, and I was very involved with Freedom Center at that time and I'd started speaking out at Freedom Center events um, you know speaking to schools and different uh, other groups of people I think that was a really like a huge part of what helped me to um, move out of move out of the system and back into the real to the rest of the world like seriously Freedom Center was the bridge for me that helped me to connect with other people who'd had similar experiences and to then be able to tell my story and know that, you know, I didn't have that much, there wasn't that much that I felt like I could do with my life at that time, but I knew that my story could help other people because I knew, I saw that there were other people who were going through things that where they had become toxic from medication. So, um, I was still writing a lot, you know, I was writing a lot of poetry and a lot of, um, like memoir about what I'd been through like a lot of for the next year I was just doing so much writing because I felt like finally I had my mind back I was able to write everything you know I I knew that I had to like tell the whole thing in my own words even though you know maybe the words now would be different (laughs) but I just it was like I just had to reclaim that all that time um and my family at that time became very supportive of me even though initially they had thought that I should be on medication you know they saw with their own eyes what it did so they, you know, now my father is like practically a Freedom Center activist. <laughs> like he like reads our webs, like the Freedom Center website every day, and like you know is really anti psychiatry. Um, so a lot of it was writing. Um, then I did a yoga teacher training. Um, uh, when was that? The following year, um, last year, uh, which also helped me a lot to develop a daily yoga practice. Um, has been really healing for me you know many other things just starting to just get involved in a lot of different things with different people it was a slow process but over time I I think especially because Freedom Center is so connected with the rest of the community in this area that it's that you know it was a situation where I was able to connect with like people in a a way that felt somehow ordinary like I didn't feel like I was in some kind of isolated place which was kind of how I felt at Windhorse. Like it was a very small community. And you're a teacher now with the Freedom Center. Yeah, I've been teaching yoga and I actually teach yoga now at Windhorse as well, which is interesting because I see a lot of the same things going on there. Um, You know, and some of the things I see are good, but a lot of the things I see are similar to what I experienced when I was there of sort of not, of like not getting the information I needed about what was what medications I was taking and just not re, not being presented with like the real facts. What do you think is different now in terms of because you're you're still very much involved in spirituality and yoga and meditation and and what is different now that it doesn't throw you into these unbalanced, ungrounded states? Um, I think part of it is just age and having gone through all of that, I'm more clear on what it is, so I know. I, I know what my limits are. I know what's like, I just feel like I have a more of an inner sense of my balance. And it's kind of like, well, maybe I needed to go through that in order to learn that, um, which I think is true for a lot of young adults, you know, needing to go through certain crises in order to learn very basic lessons. You know, I think that's one of one of the most basic parts of being human that I don't think needs to be considered an illness of any sort. It's just learning through your mistakes and going into getting into very deep, deep, hot water and then getting, getting out of it, I guess. I guess so. (laughs) What sort of warnings or cautions would you give to people who are exploring yoga or meditation and 
about the maybe the downside of that? Hmm. Well, that's a good question because I think a lot of times I feel resistant when too much warning is given because it feels to me like this, like yoga and meditation are these great things. And I, and I don't like it when too much warning is given because I think it's something that most people should explore for themselves. I do see some danger in, um, in like what happened to me, which I think happens to not a lot of people, but a few other people where there's a desire to take on a whole new path and to leave one's past totally behind them, which for me, I don't think And I think for most people, trying to just leave everything in the past behind for a whole new spiritual life can be dangerous, especially if there's some kind of guru involved or some kind of um, situation where you're putting all of your trust into a whole new thing that um, can be very ungrounding. Sounds like the dealing with your family was a big issue that maybe you should have been looking at some of the family issues there instead of just rushing off into something completely new to get away from that. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to say because the stuff with my family was so complex and still is that it can be really hard to face that. And I think it's hard to find tools in our world to face that um, sort of thing. It's, it's, I think, one of the hardest things to do, at least for me. Um, so, you know, I still definitely have a pattern of trying to escape from that. And I definitely still try to find, you know, and, and I don't see it as a bad thing necessarily. In some ways, I think it's really healthy to, for people to develop their own strength and their own sense of peace and to, in some ways, separate if they have had a family that's been really difficult. But I just think at some point, it's important to go back into, well, what was going on in my family and to look at it because I think it can be helpful. So you mentioned, you know, seeing other people who are in the system and who are having difficulty with their medication. And I know that you do a lot, do a lot of public speaking and peer counseling and, and uh, work with a lot of different people as part of the Freedom Center. Do you think that one of the ingredients that allowed you to sort of um, heal the way that you did was the fact that you didn't have to work, that your parents had some resources, that you could kind of have a little bit of space to just sort of do nothing for a while. And what would you say to somebody who says, well, you know, that that might be nice for people who have privilege and have resources, but basically if you don't have that, your best option is just to sustain the system and go along with it and to not challenge your question and just sort of stay on the medication and not really, you know, just sort of accept anything that you don't like about it. Yeah, I mean, I definitely hear that. And a lot of it has to do with the insurance and um, financial issues with insurance in this country, how the only things that are really covered by insurance are psychiatric drugs and therapy. There are really very few alternatives. And I think we're changing some of that with the Freedom Center and with other programs like the Recovery Learning Center that are starting to be developed in this area. Um, And that's a lot of the work that we do with Freedom Center is trying to provide things at low cost or mostly free, actually. Almost all of the the programs at Freedom Center are free. Um, But yeah, I definitely hear that. And I definitely feel it's true that having the space that I had has allowed me to grow in a different way. But the other thing is that there is a lot of government funding available for people. So most people, if labeled with a disability, can get government funding that can give them time to go through what they need to, which, you know, it's, it's unfortunate that we have to call ourselves ill in order to get that in other countries, you know, you can be an artist and get funded to live your life the way you want to. If people, if people want to get in touch with you and find out more about your work and read your writing and poetry, how would they do that? Well, my email address is ngrossberg at yahoo.com. That's N G R O S S B E R G at yahoo.com. Uh, a lot of my poetry is on the internet, and you can Google Chaya, C-H-A-Y-A, Grossberg, and find a lot of my poetry. Um, I also do a lot of uh, poetry readings in this area, so look for me. And um... and tell us when the yoga and the writing classes are. Um, Freedom Center now has two free yoga classes. The first one is on Mondays at 7 in the Somatic Systems Institute on Masonic Street, The second is on Thursdays at 3.30 at Forbes Library. The writing group is at 6 o'clock on Thursdays at the Quaker Space at 43 Center Street. And these are all free and open to the public. You don't have to be labeled or identified as part of the mental health system, be part of them. Right, and many people aren't. So it's really, it's another one of the great things about Freedom Center is bringing together people of all different experiences and not, not categorizing or separating people by their experiences. Great. Well, thanks a lot for joining us today, Haya Grossberg. Thank you. 
You've been listening to an interview with Haya Grossberg. Haya is a teacher of yoga and writing with the Freedom Center. And she spoke with us about her experiences in the mental health system, uh, with medication, getting off medication, her experiences as a client with Windhorse Associates in Northampton, and her spirituality. And that's about all the time we have this week for Madness Radio. Thanks a lot for tuning in. You've been listening to Madness Radio, voices and visions from outside mental health. Madness Radio is broadcast every Wednesday, 6 to 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Pacifica Affiliate, WXOJLPFM 103.3 Valley Free Radio in Northampton, Massachusetts. For our live internet stream, podcasting, show archives, and more, visit madnessradio.net. Madness Radio is co-produced by Freedom Center and The Icarus Project. For more information, check out freedom-center.org and theicarusproject.net. For more mental health radio, listen to the news hour from mindfreedom.org, Wednesdays, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you have an idea for a story or guest on Madness Radio, or you just want to share what's in your head, contact us at radio at madnessradio.net.